limitations or the um, societal issues that we have in it as a community when we do pairing-based cryptography, and in particular when we say this scheme that I just came up with that does something that I think is cool, this scheme is secure based on the following assumption. And then we give an assumption, and then we say this is a good assumption. This is an assumption that I don't know how to break, that maybe nobody knows how to break, that maybe actually is completely unbreakable. And we use that assumption to, uh, to, to justify our scheme, to justify this paper that we're writing. And what I want to talk about is how is it that we talk about these assumptions, and how can we reason about what assumptions are good or bad, and how they should be used. So in background, I want to talk first, just to make sure that we all are familiar with pairing-based cryptography. Um, I'm helped a little bit by the fact that Professor Okamoto just talked about pairing-based cryptography, and really introduced a lot of the things that I want to introduce as background. So I hope that even if my explanation doesn't make sense, his did. Um, pairings are this incredibly powerful tool for building crypto systems uh, that it's amazing to think is really has only been used to build crypto systems for a little over a decade now. So uh, pairings have been around as a mathematical object forever, as a computational mathematical object, as something that you could actually compute on curves that you care about since 1986 with Miller's algorithm. And then it took from 1986 until about 98, uh, 1986 until 1998, 99, or 2000, depending on which paper you sort of look for, uh, you look to for inspiration, to realize that pairings were not just something that was of mathematical interest, and in fact, not just something that was of destructive interest, as something that you could use to break people's bad crypto systems, but something that you might actually use as additional structure to build an interesting crypto system that you might not otherwise be able to build, or if you are otherwise able to build it, might not be able to build as efficiently, or as simply, or as cleanly, or as elegantly, or as publishably. So when we work with pairings, we work with uh, a group structure that looks like this. So we're going to have two groups, G1 and G2, that will be the arguments of the pairing, and then a GT, T stands for target, a group GT, that is the output of the pairing. And then we have this pairing, this computable bilinear map, E, that takes one element from the group G1, one element from the group G2, and maps them into the group GT in a way that has the properties that it's bilinear, non-degenerate, and efficiently computable. The, efficiently comp the efficient computability comes again from uh, Miller's classic papers. So if we compare this to the traditional groups where people do uh, discrete logarithm type cryptography, we can think of just G1 in isolation or just G2 in isolation as being one of those groups and having structure where we can have generators and we can raise them to certain powers and do traditional crypto. And when we go to the pairing-based crypto setting, we get this additional functionality, E, this additional map that has this additional structure, this bilinearity, that we didn't have before. So more or less anything that we could do before, we can still do. But we might be able to do some new things because we have a new tool. We can build something new. So the fact is that pairing-based groups arise in uh, algebraic geometry. It's not super interesting how this works, but we have an elliptic curve over some field FQ, and then some prime P dividing the order of the uh, group of points on that curve. And then G1 will be the p-torsion points in E over FQ. G2 will be the P torsion points in E over some appropriate extension of FQ. Uh, and there's a nice theorem that says that all of the P squared R torsion points, uh, sorry, the P squared P torsion points will be contained in E once we extend the field from FQ to FQ to the K. Um, and that, that's nice because that allows us to efficiently compute values because uh, none of the points has a representation that's too large, even though representations of points in G1 are actually much smaller than representations of points in G2 because we can just represent them with a single element of FQ and not K elements because we have K copies. And then the pairing is, for example, the Ve pairing or the Tate pairing, and it maps us out to the group of, sorry, that R should be a P, 
of pth roots of unity in uh, this finite field. So the pairing, so the groups G1 and G2 have are elliptic curve points with a particular operation, elliptic curve point addition, and GT is actually some uh, some sub subgroup of the mul multiplicative group of a finite field. So there is additional structure in GT that we're sort of hiding by just calling it GT. That will come up later. And if we want to implement pairing-based crypto, then we need to have some parameters. It turns out the attack that we're usually concerned about, that we, know, that we have ideas for how to solve, is discrete logarithm. And most of the other assumptions that we make would be broken if you could break discrete logarithm, but maybe could be broken without breaking discrete logarithm. So discrete logarithm in the group G1 is you're given the generator G1, little g1, and some value g1 to the x, and your role is to output what that x is. Um, so with the pairing, there's actually two different ways to attack discrete logarithm that we know of on elliptic curve groups. One is to just treat the group g1 as a completely generic group and apply completely generic discrete logarithm algorithms like uh, baby step, giant step, to recover x. And in that case, you have uh, an attack that proceeds in time about the square root of the number of elements of the group. And so if we want 80-bit discrete log security, meaning we want our scheme to resist all attacks that don't spend 2 to the 80 time, which we think of as a fair bit amount of time, then we need the size of the, uh, the, the, the group to be about 2 to the 160. That is about 2 to the 80 quantity squared. The other kind of attack is to say, well, the group GT is embedded in a finite field. And in finite fields, we have more efficient discrete logarithm algorithms. And so I'm going to take the point G1 to the x, pair it with, say, a generator for G2, get into GT, and then apply a discrete logarithm algorithm in GT. And it turns out that for this, we need, for 80-bit security, based on the current index calculus attacks that we know about, we need about, uh, we need the fq to the k, the embedding field, be about 1,000 bits, give or take. Uh, some people will give you different estimates for how big these things need to be, but it's 1,000, 1,100, something like that. And so that says, well, we need p to be something. We need q to the k to be something. And for ideal representation, we'd really like p and q to be about the same. If you remember from the previous slide, we said that we have p elements in the group G1. And each of them is represented by something that's about uh, log base 2 of q bits. So if p and q are approximately equal to each other, then we have the most compact possible representation. So if supposing we set p and q to be about the same, then that tells us what k has to be. And if you actually just calculate, in this case, 1024 divided by 160, that's about 7 and a half, or, or something like that. And so we need k to, for our curve family to have to, to be at least 7 and a half. Uh, it turns out that there's these very, very nice curves that uh, were uh, uh, introduced by Barito and Nerig that actually give you k equals 12, with p and q being essentially the same. Um, if you actually look at p and q, they should agree, if I didn't make a mistake typing these, in the first half. That's a consequence of uh, the hasse veil bound that says that the number of points on the elliptic curve is approximately the size of the underlying finite field plus an error term, the, the trace of Frobenius that's about the square root. So if we implement our curves here, then we really have this very nice structure that we can use and very nice compact representation for our elements. And I mentioned the, uh, the p torsion group. I said that there are, in fact, p squared points with, um, uh, with p torsion. What do I mean by p torsion? I mean that if you raise them to power p, or in elliptic curve terms, you multiply them by the, by the, the value p, then you get the point in infinity, the zero of the, of the group, the, identi the identity of the group. And the p torsion group is organized as a p times p matrix, or lattice. And we'll implement g1 as sort of the base of this, G2 will be some line here. And then this particular other line, uh, this other axis, is the trace 0 group. 
it's the group that um, that has a trace of, that that is sometimes used for pairing based crypto because it has very efficient uh, representation. But it's such that there's the trace map, which I've labeled uh, psi in, the, in this picture, uh, gets the value 0. And we'll use, normally we'll use uh, G2 that's not the trace map. And so we have this psi, which is an isomorphism from the group G2 from this kind of uh, slanted line down to the base. Um, in some cases, we even have a line that, uh, a map that maps up from G1 to G2. In other cases, we don't. And depending on how you do this, you end up with uh, what uh, SMART calls type 1, type 2, or type 3 pairings. It's not going to be terribly important for us here. But the nice thing, if you have a, both a, a C and a phi, as I've labeled them here, is that you can pretend that G2 doesn't exist. You can represent everything as an element of G1. And then when you want to apply the pairing, remember that a pairing doesn't apply to, an, to two elements of G1. It applies to an element of G1 and an element from G2. So if you have two elements of G1, but you want to apply the pairing to them, you take one of them, you apply the phi map. Now you're in this other line in G2. And now you apply the pairing to those two values. Um, that, that we know how to do in super singular curves. We don't think that we know how to do it in other curves. But when you do do that, then you can pretend that the pairing actually applies from the group G times the group G to the group GT. In other words, you, get, you forget this business of G1 versus G2. I'm actually going to do that in a lot of the slides that I'll use today just because it simplifies the notation. It basically cuts the amount of things that you have to track uh, by half. The thing to realize when you're doing pairing-based crypto is that if you do do that, then you end up with less efficient representation because, super, because I showed you this beautiful uh, baritoneric uh, curve. This is not a super singular curve, as it happens. So you can't use something this efficient if you want to have g1 equals g2. Um, what people tend to do in, when they're writing papers is to say, to, to represent everything as g times g to gt. In other words, pretend that they're working with super singular curves, and then put a footnote somewhere that says, well, you know, we could if we wanted to really write everything so that this lives in G1 and this lives in G2, and then we would have this more efficient representation. Um, that's fine. Sometimes when they say that, they're actually even right. Uh, sometimes they're not, but uh, that's sort of a different discussion. So, all right, so I've bored you with a bunch of elliptic curve math that we're now going to basically pretend never happened. And what I really want to talk about is the assumptions that we use when we build pairing-based crypto systems. I'll talk in just a second about what a pairing-based crypto system might look like, just in case you haven't seen one. Although I guess all of you just saw Professor Komodo's talk, so you have seen one. I'll show you a much simpler one uh, and a much less interesting one, but maybe one that'll be instructive. But first, let's talk about a few very simple assumptions. So here is a two-group analog of computational Diffie-Hellman. The computational Diffie-Hellman problem, remember, is given g, g to the a, g to the b, compute g to the a times b. Right? This is something that you can't easily compute, or at least we don't think you can easily compute, because if you take g to the a and, and g to the b, multiply them together, what you're going to get is g to the a plus b. Right? You want g to the a times b, you get g to the a plus b. It doesn't do you any good. This two-group version of that is just assigning values to, uh, to the group G1 and assigning other values to the group G2. So we'll get G2 and G2 to the A that lives in, in the group big G2, and then H lives in the, big, in the group big G1, and we're going to try to compute H to the A. That's also an element of G1 that uh, we think is hard. You can build crypto systems based on this very assumption. Um, one really cool feature of the pairing is that the, if we think back to traditional crypto groups, traditional discrete log-based groups, we think that computational Diffie-Hellman is hard, which is to say, given g, g to the a, g to the b, compute g to the a, b. But we also think that the decisional version of the same problem is hard. In other words, we think that if you're given a solution, somebody tells you, well, you know, I have some crazy new algorithm, and I've computed h to the a. I've actually solved your problem for you. You can't even tell whether they're right or not. Given g, g to the a, g to the b, g to the a, b, you can't tell whether that g to the a, b is really g to the a, b, or just g to the c for some completely unrelated c. On pairing-based groups, that's not true. 
And this is the observation that really set off a lot of the work on pairing based crypto around the year 2000 by Zhu and Nguyen. They observed that if A equals B, in other words, if we have G to the G2, G to the A, H, and H to the B, then in fact these two pairing values will be equal to each other. So in other words, if somebody gives you a purported solution H to the B, you can tell that that solution is what you're looking for. It's actually H to the A and not something useless. Right? And the reason that this works is just because of the bilinearity property. If you look at H paired with G2 to the A, by the bilinearity property, that's the same as H paired with G2, whatever value that might happen to be, raised to the power A. And if you look on the, on the right-hand side, E of H to the B paired with G2, that is just equal to E of H paired with G2, whatever that might be, raised to the power B. So it's two values, same base, and possibly different exponent in a cyclic group. Right? So if A equals B, then those two values are equal. If A is not equal to B, then those two values are different. Um, H comma G2, we could talk about why, but it follows from the properties that we saw before. H comma G2 is actually a generator. That paired, pairing value is a generator of the group GT. And so if we raise it, it's a cyclic group. And so if we raise that to different values, we're going to get different values. It's effectively, exponentiation is a permutation there. Right, so let's look at a super, this is sort of a, a, a digression, but just to get us all thinking about pairing based crypto, let's talk about short signatures that we can get using, uh, using pairings. So sometimes, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen digital signatures before. Digital signatures are effectively the computer equivalent of traditional pen and paper signatures. So you sign your name, and that means that you are somehow associating yourself with a document. You want your name and the document, whatever it says, to somehow be tied together. And people who see the document after it's been signed by you can tell that, in fact, that's something that you wanted to do. But at least if your signature is harder to forge than mine, which is basically just a squiggle, uh, at least if your signature is hard to forge, then somebody who's not you can't cause you to be associated with a document you didn't want to be associated with. Right? So digital signatures basically work the same way. You take some message, and then you take some value that only you know, some secret key, and you apply some function defined by the scheme to the message in the secret key, and out comes a short string that's a signature. And now somebody else who doesn't have your secret key can't create that signature on your behalf. That's the same as the unforgeability property. Uh, we'll formalize that in a second. And anybody who comes along can take the message, can take the signature that you've produced, and can take your public key. So this is an asymmetric uh, primitive. We've got a public key and a private key. The private key is what you use to sign. The public key is what everybody else knows and can use to verify can tell that you meant to be associated with that message. The same way that anybody who sees the document with your, uh, with, with your name on it can tell that you meant to be associated with your signature, can, can tell that you meant to be associated with whatever the contents are of that document. And so sometimes we actually need signatures to be short. Sometimes we don't care. Sometimes 1,000 bits is perfectly fine. Right, 1,000 bits is 128 bytes. Even if you encode it in some funny way, it's only under 200 bytes. That's only a couple of lines of nonsense at the end of email messages that I'm sure you get from your annoying friend who just installed Linux and thinks that signing all his messages is cool. Not a problem. Uh, in fact, if we use DSA, which is the, um, the US government's uh, signature standard, we get even shorter messages, uh, shorter signatures down to 320 bits, or in some cases, 240 bits if you massage them right. But sometimes you want something that's even shorter, like, say, 160 bits. Or, or maybe even less. And that's important when you have to type in a signature. For example, when you just bought a, a game and you have to type in the, the activation code that came with it, or if you're actually printing a digital signature as part of a postage stamp that you print at home. And there's only so much space for bits on that postage stamp. And so we'd like to do better. And it turns out we can actually do better based on pairings. I'll, I'll show you the, the incredibly simple, incredibly uninteresting scheme in just a second. But first, I just wanted to talk about what it meant uh, for a signature scheme to be unforgeable. And um, 
The classic notion for this comes from Goldwasser, Macaulay, and Rivest in 1988. The idea is that the adversary is given the public key. That's my notation PK up here. The public key is not what allows him to sign, just what allows him to verify a message. And his goal is to output a forgery, some message M star and some corresponding sigma star that verifies properly for any message of his, this choice, which is why this is called existential unforgeability. He's showing that there exists a message that he can forge a signature on. Uh, maybe that message is complete nonsense, or maybe that message is launch the nukes. Um, not really captured either way by, by this definition. But if he can't forge any message, even a complete nonsense garbage message, then he can't forge a more interesting message in particular. So this is a very strong definition. And the other way in which this is a very strong definition is that we actually allow the adversary access to, sig to a signing oracle that will sign messages on his behalf. So the adversary says, well, I'm almost ready to compute a forgery on this message. But first, I want to see what your signature looks like if I ask you to sign the message, um, uh, the Harry Potter books only got worse after book three. And you say, why would I want to sign that? And he says, well, I'd like you to. And so you go back and you sign it. And that's where your secret key comes in. The secret key is given to the signing oracle, but not to the adversary. And the, the signing oracle returns the signature on the, on the message. And the adversary can use that adaptively as many times as he'd like. We're going to quantify that maybe later by saying he can do Q queries. And then at some point, he uses he outputs a forgery. And, and the signature scheme is secure if even an adversary who has this access to a signing oracle can't produce an existential forgery on any message. OK, so that was more boring background. Let's actually look at an actual signature scheme. Here's a signature scheme. Uh, it's the BLS signature scheme from AsiaCrypt 2001 now. And it uses a random oracle hash that just takes arbitrary strings like messages and outputs an element of the group G1 or the group G, depending on how we're implementing it. And the signature scheme is just the most trivial you can imagine. Our secret key is going to be some random exponent x in the group ZP. And the public key is going to be g2 to the x. Right? So we're implicitly relying on this discrete logarithm problem being hard. We're assuming that the adversary can't recover x given g2 to the x. Right? And to sign a message, all we're going to do is we're going to hash the message. That's h of m. That's going to give us an element of the group g1. And raise that to the secret x and publish that. That's just going to be in a single element of the group g1. That's going to be the signature. And to verify, we need to check that some purported value, sigma, really was computed just that way. And the way that we do that is we use the pairing. In other words, we just compute e of sigma comma g2 and check that that equals e of h of m comma pk. And if you actually plug in all the values, you can just see that this follows by the jus nullian observation that the pairing effectively gives a DDH check. All right? Is everybody with me so far? Does this make sense? Does it not make sense? Any questions? All right. OK, so in fact, you can show that this, in the random oracle model, which is a whole other discussion. Again, in the random oracle model, the BLS signature scheme is actually secure against existential forgery if this funny two-group analog of the computational Diffie-Hellman problem that I introduced uh, a few slides ago is actually hard. So, so we have an assumption. We have a notion for how a scheme might be secure. We have an actual scheme. And now there's a security theorem that I'm not even going to bother to show you. But the nice thing here is that we actually end up with very efficient short signatures. So signatures, if we use those baritonary curves that I showed earlier, signatures are just 160 bits for 80-bit security. So um, in some sense, optimal for this kind of algebraic signature. Uh, we have implementations. Signing is very, very fast. Um, verification it requires some pairings. Pairings are a little bit slow still, but not too bad. And it turns out the scheme is so simple that you can actually use it to build a number of different properties, like a number of different variants of signatures, to add more properties on. So you get threshold signatures, blood signatures, multi-signatures, aggregate signatures. Maybe let's talk a little bit briefly about this, because this is maybe a slightly better example than just the basic BLS scheme for why pairing-based 
uh, crypto is interesting. So let me start by stating the problem that this is trying to solve and then talking about how BLS can be adapted to solve this problem. So the problem is that sometimes it's annoying that you have to transmit many different signatures on many different messages from many different signers. Right? So sometimes you only have to transmit one. In other words, there's really just one document that one person signed and you send that along and everybody's happy. But sometimes you end up with many. I'll, I'll give examples in just a second. So what you'd really like is rather than having sigma1 and having to send sigma1 along, which is a signature by user1 on message1, and sigma2, which is a signature by user2 on message2, and sigma3, which is a signature by user3 on message3, and so on, n different times. So in other words, even if your original signature was just 160 bits, now you have n times 160 bits that you're sending, you'd like to send something that's small and represents in some sense, all those signatures. When would you want that? Well, there's all sorts of times when you have many different signatures by many different signers on many different messages, and you care about space. So for example, uh, in certificate chains for X509 certificates that your browser uses, in uh, secure BGP route attestations, uh, I don't want to talk about secure routing, but uh, people keep thinking about how they can make BGP uh, messages shorter in the presence of crypto, or in the PGP Web of Trust, which is sort of an analog of the certificate chain in the distributed model where I might sign for your key because I've now met you. And here is very faintly is one example of where you might have an X509 certificate chain that starts with VeriSign's global root and then goes to VeriSign's European ch certificate authority and then authenticates a bank uh, like NatWest and then NatWest uses that key to authenticate its specific web server. And so you end up with four different signatures, three or four different signatures. And even if each one of them is short, altogether they're four times as long as they were and there's no real reason for that. Um, so what we really like is to replace all of those with a single aggregate. Um, I'm going to skip the security notion for now, but here is how to do it with BLS. I claim that if you're using BLS signatures, you can combine arbitrarily many signatures from arbitrarily many different signers on arbitrarily many different messages into a single short aggregate that's the same length as one BLS signature. So we said 160 bits for each BLS signature. We've got n of them, maybe n is a thousand, but instead of sending a thousand 160 bit elements, instead of sending a thousand signatures, we're going to send something that's just 160 bits that represents all of those signatures. And the way that we're going to do that, given all these signatures, sigma one through sigma k, is we're just going to multiply them. In other words, instead of sending sigma one and then sigma two and then sigma three and then sigma four, we're going to just send sigma one times sigma two times sigma three times sigma four up to sigma 1000 or whatever it might be. Yes, sorry. Right. Right, so, so this was a point that I was trying to sweep under the rug, and we actually don't have a rug here on the front, so that's why I was failing. Um, the thing that aggregation doesn't do for you, as, as Gene points out, is that it doesn't keep you from having to know what the message is that each signer signed and what, all each, what the identity of each signer is. Right, so in other words, we said originally that there was public keys and then message and then signature, public key, message, signature. We got rid of all the messages. We got rid of all the signatures. We replaced them with this single aggregate, but we didn't get rid of all the public keys. We didn't get rid of all the messages. So this is, uh, in some sense, this is why this is possible at all. Uh, because information, theoretically, the signature doesn't actually contain any new information you didn't have before. So you can effectively throw all the signatures away. It's also why this, this is of limited application to situations where you actually care, where you actually can tell, sorry, where you can tell what the messages are that the signers intended to sign as 
something separate. And, and I think uh, BGP is the one example where that's really pretty clear because you already have pre-existing relationship with all the different routers in the system and the messages are of a specific form like I attest to this route. So you don't actually have to send them along. Um, so in that case, maybe it helps. It does have limited applications for sure. But the embarrassing thing is that we can do it so easily using BLS. We just multiply all the signatures together. We have this one aggregate sigma. And then we run this verification algorithm that replaces this stays the same. This is the same as from the BLS verification. And then instead of just having one pairing that looked like h of m comma pk, we now have the product of many different pairings, one for each public key and message. And again, if you write this out and expand, this just works because of the bilinearity of the pairing and the properties of the BLS signature. So it's really, really simple. And it uses the properties of the pairing in a very essential way. But it's also still, to this day, the only known way of doing aggregate signatures uh, in the model that I defined earlier. Um, without pairings using something like RSA, we know how to do something that's called sequential aggregate signatures that are good for some applications, but not good for others. Right, so that was kind of as a, as a distraction, as a side effect, um, two examples of schemes based on pairing-based crypto, just to give us all a sense for what pairing-based crypto might look like. Uh, what I wanted to turn that to now for uh, most of the rest of the talk is the assumptions underlying different schemes in pairing-based cryptography. So I've already introduced the discrete logarithm problem. I've already introduced the, uh, the computational Diffie-Hellman problem or its two-group version, which is what I used for, for BLS and, uh, and the aggregate version of BLS. And we can also talk about one other really classic assumption in pairing-based crypto, which comes from the Bonnet-Franklin IBE paper, which is the uh, DBDH, uh, decisional bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem, or as some people expand it, the Dan Bonnet Diffie-Hellman problem, which says, given G, G to the A, G to the B, and G to the C, distinguish this funny element of the group GT from a completely random element of the group GT. So in other words, you're given something, and maybe it's this, or maybe it's not, and you have to say, yes, this is actually E of GG to the power ABC. That's the decisional bilinear diffie hellman problem. You can also define a computational version of that, of course, where you're given G, G to the A, G to the B, G to the C, and you're asked to compute E of GG to the A times B times C. And if you think about it, the pairing gets you some way towards computing this, but not all the way, because you might take g to the a and g to the b and pair them together, and that will give you e of gg to the power a times b. That's the bilinearity of the pairing. But it's not going to give you a times b times c, because you can only take two values in the exponent and multiply them together with the pairing. And once you've computed e of gg to the a times b, that is a value that's not in the group g1, not in the group gt, but in the, in the group g2, but it's in the group gt. It's in the target group. And we don't have a pairing that we know how to apply to elements in the, part, in the target group. So in other words, the pairing allows you to apply the, this kind of operation once, this multiplicative operation in the exponent, just once. And then you can't again. So we can compute g to the e of gg to the a times b, e of gg to the a times c, e of gg to the b times c, but not e of gg to the a times b times c, we think. If you have some way of computing that, uh, that's a path to riches and fame, or at least fame. Right, so if you looked at the state of pairing-based crypto around 2002, 2003, um, these were really the only assumptions that people worked with sort of these classic assumptions up to here. And when people tried to introduce new funny assumptions, new assumptions that were more complicated, people said, reviewers said, no, you shouldn't introduce these new assumptions. We don't know that they're true. We don't believe them. Um, why should we take your scheme if, it ha if it's based on these funny assumptions? Um, and it's very clear why you might want more complicated assumptions, why you might want more powerful assumptions, because they let you prove more powerful schemes. In other words, if there's some goal that you'd like to achieve, and you don't know how to achieve that goal based on the DBDH problem, but you do know how to achieve it based on the KBDHI problem, whatever that is, we'll see it later, then maybe it's a trade-off that's worth making. 
you make the more strong assumption. You say, this more complicated assumption, I think, is still true. I think it's still hard to solve this underlying problem, even though this problem is not as classic as maybe the discrete logarithm problem. And if you are willing to accept that, then I have this very nice scheme for you that can do something that we couldn't do before, or can do something that we couldn't do before, that we could do before, but more efficiently, or more elegantly, or with additional properties. And so for a period of some years, starting from about 2004, the direction in pairing based crypto was towards coming up with many, many new schemes that could achieve all kinds of new and exciting functionality, but based on these stronger assumptions. So there's KBDHI, KSDH that we'll see later. And then at some point, they really got crazy. They got so crazy that, in fact, I'm not going to show you this assumption. Uh, that I have in mind until I check that everybody here is over 17 and I'm not exposing minors to harmful material. Uh, let me show you this assumption. You could come up with many more. You go, go on ePrint, look at some random pairing based paper around 2008, 2009. It probably has a weird assumption. This is one of those weird assumptions. Um, I'm not even going to tell you what its name is or who's responsible for this. But um, if you remember, the, the assumptions that we talked about before were very simple assumptions. They had maybe three elements and relatively simple structure, uh, maybe four elements in the query. This assumption isn't quite like that. This is actually a whole family of assumptions, depending on this parameter L. We might set L to be 2 to the 20, so there might be a million different values that are given. And so we get G to the A, G to the A, sorry, G, G to the A, G to the B. And then L minus 1 tuples of the form, uh, G to the WI. So WI is just an independently chosen random value in ZP for each one of these tuples. G to the 1 over A plus WI. A is that A from, from the beginning of what we were given. G to the B times WI. And your goal is to output another tuple with some value W. You don't have to tell us what that value W is, but you do have to commit to it by writing G to the W. G to the 1 over A plus W. G to the B times W. Now, this is really simple to compute if you can just copy one of these original L tuples. So we're going to require that this W be different from all the WI values that you were given up here. Right? This is some assumption. And if you believe this assumption, then number one, I have a bridge that I like to sell you. Um, and number two, you can prove all sorts of very nice schemes. OK, so, so far what I've said is that We've got pairing-based crypto. Pairing-based crypto is really nice because it allows us to achieve all kinds of functionality that we didn't know how to achieve before. And the trend in pairing-based crypto over the years was towards coming up with more and more expressive schemes, more and more powerful things that we can achieve based on stronger and stronger, funnier and funnier looking assumptions. So the question is, how can we decide that an assumption is OK? In other words, if I assume something that's false, then I can probably build all sorts of very nice crypto systems based on that, but they're not actually going to be secure. So really, when we make an assumption, we'd like that assumption actually to hold. We'd like whatever problem we think is hard really to be hard, at least based on the techniques that we think people are going to come up with in the near future. Um, and there's a number of ways of doing that, in addition to the traditional crypto way of just writing down the assumption and then hoping that it actually is hard with no evidence for that. Um, one is, and we're, as a community, we're not anywhere near there for, for most kinds of crypto that we do, showing that the assumption holds unconditionally based on, say, um, P not equal to NP. Certainly none of the assumptions that we're talking about here um, that falls into that camp. So we can forget that, forget I ever said that. Another thing that we can do, and, and that's what we've done with things like factoring, or things like discrete logarithm, is to pose them as problems, as, in a sense, as targets for the community to address, as things for the community to try to solve and tell us how well they did, and see how well they hold up over the years. So absent some great new breakthrough on factoring, I can tell you that if you want to factor a 1,000-bit number, you're going to need to about 2 to the 80 work. And there's algorithms that everybody agrees on seem to be the best for factoring. They're very, very elegant algorithms. 
Um, there was a paper at this crypto a couple weeks ago that showed how to factor a 768-bit number and gave a lot of detail about the, the effort. But we more or less understand, again, absent some sort of really great breakthrough, we more or less understand how, to, um, how, how efficient factoring algorithms are or equivalently discrete logarithm algorithms. And that's because people have really looked at the problem of factoring, really studied it, and come up with the best that they could for how to break it. All right, so that is one approach. And to some extent, you could say that maybe the decisional bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem, DBDH, or some of these other classic assumptions, have actually seen this kind of scrutiny. Um, I'll talk about uh, the strong Diffie-Hellman problem as an example of, of where we do have cryptanalytic uh, considerations. Uh, for these assumptions. But for most of the assumptions that are in these crypto papers, they're not really the targets of study, as far as I can tell. People don't really try to break assumptions in crypto papers. And that's because, unlike the situation where we have factoring or discrete logarithm or strong Diffie-Hellman, they get used over and over and over for many, many different crypto systems. So it's worth studying. We got to a point as a community where, effectively, every new paper introduced its own new assumption. And so if you spent all the effort to break that assumption, you would break one paper. And maybe that paper wasn't interesting to you. Or maybe as a mathematician, you had seen the 700 other papers that had 700 other assumptions, but not that one, which you actually had the insight that would have allowed you to break. And so I don't think it's fair to say that the assumptions that we actually have in pairing breaks crypto today actually have been considered and studied in, in this rigorous way by the community. Um, and instead, what we have lately is a shortcut to deciding that an assumption actually holds, a shortcut to deciding that um, a problem is actually hard. And that shortcut is based on showing that the problem is hard when you restrict the power of the adversary. Right? An adversary, I'll show you in a second, an adversary is this very non-cooperative party that you give a problem statement to, and out comes an answer. And you have no real insight into what it does inside. In some sense, if, if you had insight into that, you would break the scheme yourself. But that's what the adversary is there for. Um, and so we don't really know what the adversary embodies. Somebody says, I can factor. He embodies in his algorithm that he runs secretly, where you can't look, some sort of new breakthrough into factoring. But we can't see that. So we can't really, right now, based on what we know, reason about it very much. But maybe if we could restrict the adversary, maybe if we could say an adversary that only does tasks of a certain, behaviors of a certain kind, only uses operations of a certain kind, then we could idealize the model and actually have results that say this assumption actually holds against adversaries that are restricted in the way that I'm considering. And if you decide, well, I'm not really concerned about other adversaries, or I don't think people are going to have be able to step out outside of this restricted model, then maybe this is a nice way of talking about assumptions. All of which is a very long, slow uh, way of getting to what I really want to talk about, what's in the title of this talk, which is the generic group model, which is the way that people doing pairing-based crypto have decided to restrict the power of an adversary and talk about whether assumptions hold or not. Right? So generic groups are a way of modeling attacks that don't rely on group structure. What do I mean by group structure? I mean that if you think about integers, an integer isn't just something that you can multiply by something else to get a different integer. It's not just something that you can add to something else to get a different integer. It's really a, a bit representation. There's a canonical representation for an integer. And you can start operating on that representation in however you wish. So an attacker that looks into the group structure, an attacker that looks into the particulars of how a group is implemented and represented, is non-generic. Conversely, an attacker that doesn't rely on any special structure of a group is generic. And the way that we're going to genericize a group to an attacker is we're not going to let the attacker see the representation of the, the, the group elements. Right? In other words, we're not, even though maybe the attacker is working on integers, if we're working in a discrete logarithm group over, um, over ZP star, for example, even though the attacker is working with integers, we're not going to let him see the integers. We're just going to let him see the group elements. 
and we're going to help him perform the group operations that he no longer can himself because the group operations call for understanding what the actual values are and how you operate on them. Right? So once we do that, we're, it turns out we're actually going to be able to unrestrict the adversary from in, in any other way. Okay, so uh, uh, that was just sort of an overview. I'll, I'll give examples in a second for how this actually is going to look. But this is, this is an idea with a long history, goes back to black box groups, which were used in mathematics by Bye Bye uh, and uh, Samaretti. And they were first used, uh, generic groups were first used by Nakayev and Anshup to study the discrete logarithm problem in cryptography. So this is the first application to cryptography of this kind of idea. Um, and then they were brought into pairing based crypto in this paper, very influential paper by Bonin Boyan, which took which replaced just a group. Remember, we have, um, if it's a generic group, it's a group, it doesn't have additional structure. Uh, replace a group with groups G, G1, GT, or if we want to collapse G1 and G2, then just G and GT, uh, and considered pairings between them. So in other words, it genericized not just a single group, but actually all three of the groups plus the additional pairing structure that we have between them. And then it argued that a certain problem that they introduced was actually hard in this generic way. And since then, basically every paper in pairing based crypto that introduces a new assumption follows Bonnet and Boyen by saying, well, our assumption too is secure in a generic pairing based uh, kind of group setting. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we interact with an adversary, for example, to solve the computational Diffie Hellman problem. All right, so if you think about it, you're asking the adversary to give you g to the a, b, when you give him g, g to the a, g to the b, and the description of the group that he's operating in. So that might be, um, for example, the order of the group or uh, maybe the elliptic curve that it comes from. And if you actually think about how this works, maybe what you do is you effectively have the adversary be a Turing machine, and then you'd run it with preloading its input tape to contain some representation in its input alphabet of the group G, of the group order P, of the elements G, G to the A, G to the B, and, G to the, and then it'll run for a while, maybe you'll bound how long it runs to a time polynomial in its input length. And at some point it'll stop and it'll spit out G to the AB. So that the representation of that, again in whatever input alpha, in whatever alphabet, tape alphabet it uses, will be written to its output tape. Or maybe it'll erase its input tape and write uh, G to the AB on its input tape. It doesn't really matter exactly how you formalize this. But the crucial insight here is that in the absence of oracles for higher level schemes like assigning oracle or something like that, we don't really interact with the adversary when we give it the discrete, the, the, the diffie hellman problem. Because it's given G to, and G to the A and G to the B, and if it wants to compute G to the A plus g to the b, or sorry, g to the a times g to the b because the group operation multiplication. If it wants to apply the group operation, it can because part of what we gave it is the description of the group g, which allows it to perform the operation that defines the group g. Right? So if the group operation is multiplication and the adversary wants to compute g times g, then it takes the representation that we gave it of the element g, that's this thing here, and it takes two copies of that and then it applies the algorithm that defines the group G's operation, and it gets some other bit representation that represents G times G, or G squared. Right? And if it wants to compute G cubed, it can do that too. G to the fourth, it does that too. It doesn't have to bug us. And the reason it doesn't have to bug us is because it has access to the actual element representation and the operation for how to combine those elements. Right? So it, it does that all internally. If we're playing this same game generically, then we don't actually give the adversary g and g to the a and g to the b. We give them some bit strings, completely opaque representation, that stand for g, g to the a, and g to the b. These are sort of like tokens. They're redeemable for one g to the a. They're redeemable for one g to the b. But they don't represent g to the a in any particular way. And there's no way to define an operation that takes g, this opaque representation of g, and outputs g times g. So the adversary is kept from looking into the structure of the group. He's not given the group. 
All he's given is these things that stand for element, these sort of promises for elements. And his goal is still to compute g to the a times b, right? So we'll have to output the opaque representation of that. Now, if you think about it, this is actually completely unsolvable because these three things are just some bit strings. And this thing at the bottom is just some bit string again. And they have no relation between them. So of course, the adversary has no way of succeeding in doing that. But if we think about that a little bit more, then we realize that the reason that the adversary has no way of succeeding here is because we've idealized the situation too much. We've taken away not only the adversary's ability to look inside the group, to look at the group structure, to look at the way that elements are represented and the group operation works, we've also taken away the adversary's ability just to apply sort of the group's public interface, if we think in programming terms. There's a way taking two elements in the group to combine them by applying the group operation. And that's something the adversary should do, even generically. He's not looking at the particular structure. He's not doing anything really funny. But he is applying two elements together. And so in order to fix this up, we're going to give him an operation, an oracle that performs the group operation. So in other words, if he takes these encoded versions of u and v, which to him are just bit strings, complete nonsense, gives them to the group oracle, then the group oracle will take those two values, open up the envelopes to see what's inside, figure out that this one stands for u, this one stands for v, apply the group operation to them, get u times v, put that in a new envelope, and send it to the adversary. Right? So the adversary can't compute g times g, that is g squared, but he can with the group, oracle, group operation oracle's help. Right? So he will just take the token that stands for g, give two copies of that to the group operation oracle, and out will come a token for g squared. He'll take that token and the token for g, give that to the group oracle, and out comes g cubed. Right? Does this make sense? Does this not make sense? OK. We can definitely go back to this if at any point any of the other stuff doesn't make sense. And now what we'll do is we'll say, we'll stop counting how long the adversary runs. We'll just start worrying about how many operations it makes here. As a complete detour, I want to talk just a tiny bit about a different way of idealizing. What we just idealized here is the adversary. We said the adversary can no longer look into the structure of the group, can no longer perform any operation that he might want to perform but instead is bound to perform only the operations that are allowed by the official structure of the group. In other words, if there's one group operation, that's the only thing he's allowed to compute and nothing else. Um, another way of arguing is to idealize not the adversary, but the reduction. So far, I've only talked about adversaries against problems, something that solves factoring, something that solves discrete logarithm. But when we prove a scheme secure based on an assumption, what we're really showing is a reduction between two adversaries. We're saying, if there exists an adversary that breaks the BLS signature scheme, then there must also exist an adversary that breaks the uh, computational Diffie-Hellman problem on two groups, this funny version of computational Diffie-Hellman that I defined. So uh, Bonet and Venkatesan in 98 showed this a very beautiful result that will actually come up later uh, that says that breaking RSA may not be equivalent to factoring. So factoring, certainly if you can factor, you can break the RSA problem. But maybe you can break the RSA problem some other way. And this paper provided evidence that, in fact, that, that might be the case, that it might be possible to break low exponent RSA without breaking factoring. Right, the, the RSA problem is given x to compute x to the 1 over e modulo the modulus n. Right, so what they actually showed is that if there exists an idealized reduction, we'll talk about idealization in, this, in, in a second, if there exists an idealized reduction that takes a completely unconstrained low exponent RSA breaker and uses that to break factoring, then in fact we can take that reduction by itself without the low exponent RSA breaker and break factoring just using the reduction. So in other words, if you're able to show me the reduction, if you're able to prove to me 
that low exponent RSA is equivalent to factoring in the sense, then factoring was easy to begin with. So the whole problem is, is uninteresting. And the way we idealize the reduction is as what's known as a straight line pro program. It's sort of a technical detail, not, re not really relevant to what we're saying here. But they idealize the reduction, but not the adversary. So what we're really doing when we're studying generic groups is we're idealizing the adversary, but not the reduction. Um, and whether you think this model makes sense or the generic group model that makes more sense that we'll talk about in every slide except this one depends on whether you think that adversaries, things that break assumptions, are more likely to be ideal or simple or generic, or whether you think that reductions are more likely to be ideal or simple or generic. All right. So what I want to do as maybe the last thing before we take a break is to give an idea for how a generic proof of security for some assumption might go. So, all right, so let's prove the, the decision Diffie Hellman assumption holds in a generic group, a generic group without a pairing. Right? So, we're, no pairings here, we're just working in generic groups. So, all we have, the only operation that's involved is the group operation. Take u and v and output u times v. Right, so we'll give the adversary g, g to the a, and the g to the b. And then we'll have to have the adversary tell us whether some value is uh, g to the a, b or not. Sorry, the a, b here should be in the exponent. This shouldn't be the word gab. Um, and the, the way that we're going to do that is, uh, this is a bit of a, a technicality, we're going to give him both g to the a, b, and some completely random value. For some reason, dollar sign stands for random. Um, and we just won't tell him what order we give them to him in. And his goal is to tell whether t0, the first value that he's given, is actually g to the ab, or whether t1 is. And he wins if he guesses right. So we'll bound his advantage over uh, 1 half. Right, so remember that we're given the adversary these opaque representations, these bit strings that don't mean anything, that stand for values. So that's what we'll give him. But internally, we'll track a mapping between those values that we give him and something that's more tractable, something that we can work with more easily. And it turns out the thing that we can work with more easily is polynomials in the three variables x, y, and z, formal variables x, y, and z, over fp. Right, so the way that these polynomials are going to work is effectively they're going to be um, g to whatever it is. So in other words, if we want to give the adversary the opaque representation of g, well, we're going to pick some random bit string and give, them to, to, to give that to the adversary. But internally, we're going to encode the value g that we give him as the, as the polynomial 1, this very uninteresting constant polynomial, because g to the 1 is equal to g. All right? And in, when we're going to give him an opaque representation of g to the a, we'll, give him, we'll store x here. So the variable x will stand for this secret unknown value, little a. Right? And the variable y will stand for, for little b. And then g to the a, b, of course, is just going to be the, the polynomial x times y. And uh, the random value will just be z, which is unrelated to anything else. Right, so in other words, for each value that we give the adversary in encoded form, we'll also re record it in this way that's very convenient for us. And we'll use that, that recorded form as a way of doing the, ob as a way of doing the operations. Right, so we're going to give the adversary the encodings of 1, x, y, uh, x, y, and z. Remember, x, y stands for g to the a, b, z stands for the other random element, and they're going to come in some order, but, we, but the adversary doesn't know which one. And we're going to give them a way of performing group operations on these things. So that's going to take u and v and compute uv. And if we think of this as sort of a discrete log thing, then multiplication is the same as addition in the exponent. So in other words, if we have g to the r times g to the s, that's g to the r plus s. And so effectively, when he wants to take two values and multiply them, we'll record 
in our internal bookkeeping system the addition of the two polynomials that those two values uh, um, uh, represented. So in other words, the addition of the multiplication of g, which is encoded by 1, and g, which is also encoded by 1, is going to be 1 plus 1, which is 2. So because g times g equals g squared. All right, or the multiplication of g to the a and g to the b is going to be g to the x plus y. So we'll write down x plus y internally. And here is the, the real key observation of the proof. If the adversary is only given group operations, in other words, if he can only take two values from his list of values that he's computed so far and add them, then as polynomials, there's no way that he can form from any of these here the value x times y. Right? Because he's only given addition. So he can compute some constant plus some constant times the variable x plus some constant times the variable y plus even some constant times the variable z. But that's never going to equal x times y because that requires multiplication in the exponent which he doesn't have access to. And so that means that if we look at the adversary's list of values that he generates, there's never going to be two elements that are equal to each other, except if he computed the same thing twice. Right? Okay, this is kind of a slippery point, so I want to make sure that, that, that we get this. If this is our internal encoding, then the adversary is simply incapable of ever producing the value x times y. Or, for that matter, the value z. Because all he has to work with is 1, x, and y. And he can't multiply them. He can only add them together. All right, so if he never produces a value that's equal to x times y, then he can't ever tell whether the first element that he was given is x times y or whether it's z and the second element is x times y. Right, because if he does compute the same value twice, we have to give him the same encoding of that value. There's some opaque encoding for g to the ab. And the adversary maybe doesn't know what that is. But if he computes it twice, we're going to have to give him the same thing. And he'll be able to take those two bit strings and run a comparison operation on them and tell that he's managed to find x times y. In other words, if he had some sort of um, solver oracle that given two values gave him effectively the product of the two polynomials for those values, then he could just take that, multiply it together.